Friends, I greet you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Palm Sunday is one of my favorite services all year. I love the procession, you know, where we come in and wave palms and sing. Unfortunately, this year we don't really have the procession, but we look forward to that next year. As Father Don has said, it is a joyous occasion. But I often wonder how it was like then, back in the day, when Jesus processed into Jerusalem the few days before Passover on a donkey. A crowd of people lining the streets, laying their cloaks on the ground and shouting about the arrival of a king. The record must have, that have created must have caught the attention of the Pharisees, who would have been shocked when they found out what was happening. How could this wandering, homeless Jewish preacher, known to have surrounded himself with the underbelly of society, glorify himself like that, especially before a major religious holiday? They also must have been shocked at how this, uh, at how this was, seeing that what he did paralleled the triumphant entry of military leaders and political rulers into cities. But this was a clearly political move that Jesus carefully planned out. His procession on an unridden colt was in stark contrast to the riding of the well-worked steeds that powerful leaders would have processed on. And the people, oh, the people that came up to welcome him, they were of the low classes, the poor, the destitute, the sick, and their dirty, disgusting cloaks. This would have been opposite to people welcoming the victors of war or the emperors and their representatives. They would have been flanked by the rich, the upper classes, the merchants, the civil servants and the who's who of the day, the Hollywood superstars of first century Israel and Palestine. Was this an uprising or revolution that Jesus hoped to achieve? Well, to the Pharisees, the answer was most definitely yes. Jesus' dangerous actions would start a revolution to overthrow those in power, the religious elites, and with them, the supporting economic and political power structures that they have been pandering to in order to maintain their control. Jesus' actions and rumours about his ministry that spread to the city had a subtle proclamation that he was the messianic leader the Jews were waiting for. But to the Pharisees, he was no messiah. He was a charlatan. He did not even fit the traditional image of the messiah. He was not king-like at all, especially with his following and with what little political power he commanded. But yet he was still dangerous to the order in place. He was like an anarchist and one to be feared by those who held power. When they, failed to, when they failed in stopping Jesus' followers from shouting out and realized that even the stones would shout out if Jesus' followers kept quiet, the religious elite then hatched plans to have Jesus killed and to turn the crowd against him. So this is where I want to focus my sermon on today, the crowd. When I was growing up, as some of you would know, in a more evangelical church setting, the common understanding that I had was that the same people who demanded Jesus' crucifixion were the same people welcoming him into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It was like they took the bait of the religious authorities and five days later turned on their leader. I felt like I was guilt-tripped as a kid to believe that I had received blessings and healing from Jesus like the crowd, only to turn against him and abandon him once he outlived our usefulness like the sinners that we were, so that he could die for our unworthiness in order to satisfy God's wrath and save us from our sins. I'm sure most of you have heard something like that in your lives. However, after many years of undoing poor theology, I wondered if the crowd welcoming Jesus were really the same bunch who had turned against him. Reflecting back on the stories of Jesus' interaction with the common people, I realized that some of them actually got his message of love and grace. 
some of them were truly transformed. I think of the woman who anointed his feet with oil and tears, of Mary and Martha that Father Don spoke of last week, the Samaritan woman at the well, the bleeding woman who touched his cloak, the paralytic at Bethsaida, the Samaritan leper, the blind man at Bethsaida. The list goes on. What if the healing that Jesus provided these individuals were not just physical ones, but ones of hope and empowerment in a world which casts them aside? Maybe the people that were lining the road that day were the people who got his message. The 5,000 who were fed. Those who were there that day as he gave his sermon on the mount. I believe that they were welcoming a personal hero who gave them a hope that could change the world through the notion of love and compassion. That the kingdom of heaven would be realized if they gathered, loving and serving one another as the people of God. I am sure that the people who lined the streets were at Jesus' Jesus' crucifixion, most definitely, but not as the ones who were shouting, crucify him. To me, they were the ones who were there to give him emotional support as he stood trial. They were the ones who did not abandon him. They were the ones who carried him as he fell and wiped his face as he perspired. They must have been distraught that the very person who inspired them had been killed by the powers that be. And I believe that they held on to his vision of hope for a better world in love that he gave them in their hearts and knew that things would get better. As I reflect on the people gathered along the streets during Palm Sunday, I couldn't help but think about Canada's greatest hero, Terry Fox. I've always known about the Terry Fox run as a kid growing up, but never really knew its origins and its backstory until I got here to Canada. I remember learning about the tens of thousands of people across Canada who was moved by Terry's dedication and his defiance in the face of cancer and of a society that did not really give a lot of attention to those who had cancer in those days in order to raise awareness and research, uh, awareness and funds for cancer research during his brave run that he took across the country despite having lost a leg to that terribly oppressive disease. The love and compassion of coming together of Canada for a hero dying of cancer changed not only the country, but the world when it came to tackling that horrible disease. I can't help but think of those people who stood by Terry as he eventually died when his cancer spread, after completing only a small portion of his run. Terry's death must have had devastating effects on the nation, but the hope he left in his fellow countrymen and women that change would only come if they gathered together revolutionized cancer research and awareness. Today, the Terry Fox Run has grown to involve millions of participants in over 60 countries and is now the world's largest one-day fundraiser for cancer research. With Wikipedia noting that over $800 million has been raised in his name as of April 2020. Our awareness of cancer and its impacts improved with Terry Fox's ultimate death, but it was not solely because of his personal run and his personal ambitions, but the hope he left in the millions he touched, especially here in Canada, and those inspired by his message and his actions. So this Palm Sunday, as we gather to commemorate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, let us remember the hope his message and ministry has brought for each of us. Every challenge that we faced in history, we overcame with hope. Every challenge that is now, with the COVID pandemic and the wars in Ukraine and around the world, and those challenges yet to come, we face with hope. Knowing that the kingdom of heaven, the fullness of the world that is yet to be, comes in hope and love as we unite in one.
Amen.